So good morning. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me here. And uh, I guess what I'm going to talk about today is, of course, based on what we've all been working on. Um, it has to do with, it's based on an observation, is that all um, biologically, uh, all biologic information processing uh, associated with interpreting um, input from the sensor, biological sensors, has two major characteristics that we uh, think are important. First of all, it's massively parallel. Uh, everything is done in parallel, and it, but it's not independent parallel streams or collective parallel streams. So we think that's important. Uh, and it's also done with low precision analog type devices. Uh, of course, uh, also Biologic information processing is done. Biologic information processing is done with organic structures uh, using wet chemistry, which we don't necessarily know how to, to do very well. Uh, so what the goal is to try and find ways of reproducing some of that functionality with devices and circuits and systems that we think we can build. And for that reason, I picked this topic. Uh, convolution is, turns out to be a significant part of most uh, vision processing pattern interpretation uh, t uh, architectures today. And we are going to show you how we, we, can, we can do um, um, image recognition, pattern recognition using arrays of oscillators, which are, which are parallel and are low energy and our analog and structure. So the background, I think, I'm sure almost everybody in this room knows, uh, but for my talk to make sense, there are certain elements of background that I'll just flip through very quickly here uh, and make sure everybody's on the same page because I'm not going to take time uh, to explain it. First of all, uh, recursive networks, particularly hot field networks, uh, seem to be uh, ubiquitous in cognitive systems. That was first noted by uh, uh, John Hopfield back in the 80s when he introduced neuromorphic computing with uh, Carver Mead. Uh, so that's an important uh, aspect of what we're doing. Uh, second of all, uh, Hoppenstedt and Isakiewicz. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. <clears throat> so Hop, uh, Hoppenstedt and Isakiewicz then built on those recursive networks and realized that if you implemented a recursive network uh, built with um, uh, arrays of oscillators, you could actually do image, uh, image recognition, a pattern recognition functionality. The third piece uh, that, that helped motivate us to get started in this is there are a number of new nanoelectronic devices that are coming available in the research community, uh, including spin torque oscillators, resonant body oscillators, and a new exciting one called met metal insulator transition oscillators, in addition to NIMS that could be used uh, to populate uh, these recursive networks of oscillators. So uh, they're also in parallel to that there's a lot of progress been made uh, in developing the architecture, and, and particularly cellular uh, co or convolutional neural networks have shown to be quite effective in doing uh, real life image recognition, pattern recognition functions. Um, as, as the name implies, the convolutional filtering operation is the key computational kernel in convolutional neural networks and it turns out in many other uh, vision processing uh, systems as well. So, and that's the reason Intel is interested. Big data means big computing and uh, being able to manufacture big computing solutions is of course of interest to us, uh, which explains why we're, why we're interested. So with th those are the factors that help motivate and put in context the topic today that I'll focus in is a rather narrow topic and to show you how we can do convolution integrals 
with an array of oscillators, uh, as, and, but know that this is a key, key element of larger vision processing systems. So the next question is why now? Um, in 1993, Intel uh, brought out a neural network chip, uh, the NI1000, and uh, uh, I've heard about that on the elevator this morning. It was developed in conjunction with Nestor and uh, with DARPA support. But it also happens that in 1993, DARPA introduced the 487. So I don't think I need to tell you what happened next. Uh, Intel put its resources into the 487, and, um, and the NI-1000 died a swift and quiet death. <laughs> so, but things are changing, and as Dan has eloquently pointed out on previous occasions, uh, the demand for processing is outstripping uh, what we think, what everybody agrees is uh, asymptoting or slowing down Moore's law. So if you looked at just a couple of years at the demands of just the military, uh, they exceed by seven orders of magnitude the computational availability of, uh, of, um, of what we can expect with Moore's Law's processing. So that picture has changed. And the other aspect is new nanoelectronic devices uh, that the industry really doesn't quite know what to do with those have also become available, and that's factoring into uh, the decision uh, to go forward with this. So the bo bottom line here is we think there may be an opportunity to develop low power systems for image processing and big data analysis, which uh, just explains why I'm here today. So the first thing I'm going to talk about uh, in a little more detail is spin torque oscillators. These are coming along rapidly. There's a lot of work going on in, on these in the research community as well as in industry. And I'll just uh, give you a couple of slides to tell you what they are and give you a flavor for how they work. But first, what I want to do is uh, show you one little video which uh, w explains the whole, uh, the whole idea of why uh, we're interested in, in a couple of oscillators. Tension bells. So what you see here, this uh, gentleman has five metronomes sitting on a rigid table, and they're all slightly different frequency, and they're all doing their own things, and uh, they they tend to oscillate independently of each other. Now watch what happens when he picks the board up, sets it up on the coke cans and introducing coupling. Basically, the independent metronomes quit uh, acting as individual metronomes, but they begin to interact as a system. And when they do that, uh, the system wants to seek its lowest energy state, which is, it turns out, the synchronized state. So what you see is, because of the physics of the situation, the metronomes want to synchronize. Uh, they'll tr they will synchronize if the frequency spread is not too great. And what you see over on the left-hand side, you see two oscillators which are trying to pull out a phase but, but can't quite do it, uh, and they get pulled back in. So the system is operating as a simple harmonic system with an attractor which is pulling in uh, the oscillators into one common, uh, one common frequency uh, and phase locking. Now this system gives you information about the input. It tell, what you know is that if the input is not too widely spread in frequency, it will synchronize. So that's a key thing to keep in mind. The oscillators are giving you information about the, about the input, um, the, the input uh, structure, and, and they're doing computing for you. They're telling you how large that, that uh, spread is. So with that in mind, uh, just I'll throw up a couple of slides on what a spin fork oscillator is. In the simplest form, it's a slab of ferromagnetic material uh, placed on a substrate of some, some, some sort. A, a spin polarized current 
is, is flows normally through through the uh, through the uh, ferromagnetic material, and that induces a motion of the, uh, induces a torque on uh, on the magnetization vector of the of the magnetic material. That torque will cause the, the, the magnetic vector to precess around the normal axis. And when you get just the right amount of current so that the torque is just offset by the damping, then you get an oscillator. And you get the behavior that you, you see here in the, in the lower left-hand corner. You see as a function of time, the oscillator amplitude builds up and it hits a limited value which is also shown in the phase space where a limit cycle is clearly defined. Now these are frequency controlled devices. They're, you can change the frequency by changing the current. They typically operate in, in, the, in the range of 10 to 20 gigahertz. Uh, they're 30 to 50 nanometers in size. All that is very compatible with conventional CMOS systems. And the materials involved are not exotic, they're very uh, common to, to CMOS processing, uh, and they're, they make good candidates for, uh, for an oscillator system. The other nice thing about spin torque oscillators is that they will synchronize spontaneously. Uh, back in 2005, uh, the group at NIST uh, showed the synchronization of two oscillators. These are 40 nanometer contacts uh, placed approximately 500 nanometers apart. And in the lower left-hand corner, you see, on the lower right-hand corner, you see uh, the traces of two different, you see the traces of the two oscillators. One of the oscillators is held fixed at eight nanometers, and this is the trace here, the oscillator A. And if there was no coupling involved, this would just stay constant at, uh, at a certain frequency. Now, the other oscillator is swept over the range of 7 milliamps to 12 milliamps in this experiment. And over a period of this frequency range, they phase lock. So what that means is there's frequency entrainment. The two frequencies get locked together. And, um, um, and, uh, and, uh, and you can also see that the power uh, peaks up, you, the, the, uh, the, that value of the uh, color-coded into the, into the contour plot, you see that when they coherently add, the power picks up. So that's two oscillators. To, to do anything useful, we're going to have to get more than two. So we basically, uh, uh, the, the group at NIST, uh, constructed a set of four oscillators with one common contact to see if, uh, how well they would synchronize. Uh, it turned out for this case, there was a little too much variation uh, in, in the natural frequencies of the oscillators. So only three out of the four, uh, four were able to synchronize. And because of the way it was fabricated, there, was not, there were no independent uh, contacts uh, to, the, to the individual oscillators. So the individual frequency could not be adjusted. And uh, what you, so what you see is three of the four synchronize, the fourth one continues to do its own thing. But in principle, there's no reason why arbitrarily large numbers of these uh, won't, won't synchronize, and we've got many simulations that show that. So what is indicated that we need tighter manufacturing control uh, to get better uniformity of the devices, uh, <clears throat> to get phase locking, over a larger number of oscillators. So now a couple of words about convolutional neural networks and, and the importance of convolutional filtering. So I think everybody knows what a convolutional network is. It's basically, uh, it, was a, it was a process, it was an architecture developed by LeCun and his associates at New York University. But what it is, is it's a sequence of filtering operations where, um, where uh, features are extracted via a convolution uh, filtering operation, and then they're subsampled onto another smaller mesh. And that process continues through some number of stages until you get to a, a set of uh, subsampled images which have, 
which can be directly compared with each other and, and, and uh, uh, class identified, and we can make the identification. Uh, these are well known, they're quite successful, but they're normally implemented with CMOS, and of course the, the dominant um, computational component of doing these is the convolution integral. So the op filtering operation, uh, let's say a few words about that, you can use any filter you want, but one of the common filters that you see many times is the Gabor filter, and I think most people know what that is. It's the functional form of it is shown here. It has three independent parameters. Uh, the S parameter will basically uh, uh, determine the locality, the size of the filter, uh, and the K and theta parameters will determine the, the orientation and the periodicity. And this is especially good for finding edges, uh, the, the Gawar filters. You can generate an arbitrary number of these. This is a continuous function of its parameters. But if you just generate 24 specific cases uh, where we keep S constant, but change the, or the theta angle and change K, you get a set of Gabor fil 24 Gabor filters that look like this. And these are defined on a 7 by 7 49 element uh, mesh. To show how that is used in practice, uh, you take an image like, like you see on the left uh, and extract one small uh, subset of pixels from this image. This is a 512 by 512 8-bit grayscale image. And you extract a 7 by 7, uh, uh, 7 by 7 subset out of this, just arbitrarily. Of course, you wind up sweeping the whole image with these um, uh, subsets, dividing it up into the subsets, but then you get um, uh, the subset you see here. You form the dot product, which is directly proportional to the convolutional integral. The top equation is basically just the convolution integral. Uh, that's numerically, if you, if you write that as a finite approximation, that comes out to be just identical to the dot product uh, of, 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 of two matrices in two dimensions, or you can put that into a one-dimensional matrix and just stretch it out. So the dot product is equivalent to the convolutional integral. Now, if you go back to that little subsection that I showed you, that image fragment had the black and white uh, pixel distribution that I show here. Uh, now, uh, if you just convolve or, or do the dot product of that segment with each of the 24 filters, you see four filters are best matches, and 10 being the best, eight second best, four and three behind that. And you can kind of see why if you look at the, the, the distribution of, uh, of pixels in the in the, in the subsample for those two images. You can see that the two images, the two Gabor filters are, make a pretty good match to the distribution in here. So what you would say is that these two, you extracted the key features of this seven by seven sample in terms of a, a combination of these two uh, Gabor filters. So now, I'll, I'll, this is how you do it algebraically with CMOS or just using Boolean operators. I'll now talk about how you do this with, um, with an array of oscillators. So what I've shown on the left here is what, we're, what I've just explained. You actually do the form, form the dot product of, uh, the, of the filter function times the fragment and evaluate what that sum is. To do it in the, with oscillators in the non-Boolean fashion, what you do is you calculate, uh, uh, you, 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 you calculate the, the complex amplitude of each of the oscillators, and I'll tell you how they're uh, initialized, and then you do the sum and take the absolute value, and that forms what we call a degree of match which is an indicator of which filter function is the best match to that element. 
these, these are the equations that we actually use to simulate the oscillators. They're coupled van der Poel equations. Z is the complex amplitude of each, uh, am of each oscillator. It has a real and imaginary component. Uh, the imaginary component, of course, is just the frequency, and the real part tells you whether it's growing or damping. But it also has uh, a, a, a damping factor, which is a damping factor rho, which is the inverse of the Q factor. It has a nonlinear factor, which, is, which uh, assures uh, stability. And then there's a coupling parameter, eta, which tells how strongly these oscillators are coupled together. In addition, we can introduce a coupling matrix to, so that if, if we wanted to introduce non-uniform coupling, we could do that, but, but now we don't. Right, n is the number of oscillators here. So I should mention also that there are various network topologies that can, of course, be used. The way you connect the, the, the individual elements are very, and there are quite a few different ways in the literature. <clears throat> On the left, you see the nearest neighbor uh, uh, connection scheme, which is typical of, of cellular neural networks. In the middle, you see legion, which is locally, a uh, local excitation globally inhibited, which is another uh, scheme of connectivity which uh, uh, reproduces a lot of the functionality, or some of the functionality in the human brain. But on the right, we see uh, the connectivity uh, that we use, and that involves having a central summing node. Uh, you can think of the oscillators as being spokes on a wheel, uh, being located at the end of spokes. Yeah, there's a central averager node where each oscillator talks to the central averager, and the central averager then, then broadcasts the average value of the RF signals uh, back to each oscillator. More specifically, this is, this is consider for the seven by seven, there'll be 49 oscillators in this, I'm just showing five, but each oscillator is uh, characterized by a center frequency and an offset frequency, delta omega times what I say is F1 minus G1. Now, F1 is the filter function, it's the Gabor filter function, and, and G1 is the value of the of the subset image that we chose or ch trying to, to, to classify. So you initialize each oscillator with the difference between, uh, between the Gabor filter and, uh, and the uh, image sample, and then you turn the oscillators loose, that they run, they synchronize or not, and the degree of synchronization is a direct measure of how closely your filter matches uh, your sample. To look at it in frequency space, remember I told you these are uh, uh, variable frequency oscillators. If you start off with a good match to, uh, to the image, and remember Gabor filter three was a good match, when you do the differencing operation, what you see is that most of the oscillators will be initialized with zero offset. The, the two cancel each other. The cases where they don't, they're additive. So oscillator two in this case is initialized with a frequency offset from the, from the, uh, from, from the uh, equilibrium frequency and so on down for the other oscillators. Uh, on the other hand, the poor match that you see over on the right hand side is where there's not much overlap between the filter function and the original, uh, original uh, subsegment, and there the frequencies are spread. You have a wide spread in the frequency, and that has a much harder time of, um, of synchronizing. If you look at the direct simulation, this is a case with a poor match. These are the phases as a function of time. You see, there's no evidence of phase locking here. The phase difference just continues to increase linearly in time. Uh, the frequencies do not show any sign of frequency locking. They're spread out. And consequently, the degree of match, which is just the, the, the summed, the coherently summed value 
of, uh, of, of the RF frequencies is low. On the other hand, if you have a good match, what you see is you see phase locking occurs rather quickly. Uh, within 50 time steps, it's phase locked. You, you see the frequencies all coalesce to a common frequency. And, uh, and consequently, when you do the sum, uh, the, you calculate the degree of match, you get a high value, and it, uh, it reaches that rather quickly. So this is, this is how we calculate the degree of match. Now, if you can compare the degree of match function calculated with, uh, with, the, with the non boolean oscillators to the direct calculation of the dot product, you can compare the two. And what you see is that uh, the, the image samples which have the best agreement indicated by a high degree of match or a high F dot G product, the two methodologies agree completely as to which are the best matches. In other words, the oscillators have picked out for you the degree of match of the oscillators uh, of, the, of the image filter, which is the best match to the filter. And that, in a nutshell, is how the, we do convolutional, in, uh, convolutional uh, filtering with the rows of oscillators. Now, we've still got a problem. If you remember, we have a 512 by 512 image, or really much bigger, <clears throat> much bigger images, and a 7 by 7 um, filter. So we have to have some way of breaking, uh, doing distributed convolutional filtering, breaking the large field up into a number of smaller fields. And the way we do that is that we basically do it in parallel. So we, we, have, we define what's called an inference module. And in this case, there would be 49 oscillators in one inference module. And what happens is that these are initiated so that for each inference module, that does the direct comparison between one of the 24 filter functions and that image segment. And it does that, of course, in unit time. It does that in the few nanoseconds that it takes the oscillators to converge. Uh, so and this is all done in parallel. We'll have another block uh, over or the adjacent block. We'll do adjacent um, um, filter uh, adjacent segments. And we can run through the entire set of, of subsegments across the entire mesh uh, and compare each one to, uh, to itself. When, when you get the result, the degree of match from each of these image, image modules, uh, there's a winner-take-all circuit that picks out the best match. And then that's fed up to the next stage in the convolution, convolutional neural, um, neural network. So and, and that's the way you decompose the large image. Now, it's much more complicated than that. You have to have, uh, you have, to have data flows. You have to have uh, store, local storage to, to store the fragments. Um, so and you've got to do D to A conversions. There are many uh, things, many aspects of making this work. And I'm not Pollyanna on this at all. But, it, but still, this is, this is the uh, idea of how it works. You can get a little closer uh, feel for that if you look uh, at how these these work. If you do a two-dimensional plot of frequency versus pattern number uh, for for two different segments, uh, what you see is the frequency when you have a good match. The frequency spectrum is peaked, plus the values are high. So this allows you to pick off uh, very easily uh, which which uh, which uh, Gabor filters are the best match to that particular image segment. Now, remember there are two free parameters in here that I told you about. Uh, there's damping and there's, uh, uh, and there's coupling factor. And those have to be chosen uh, consistently. If, if you take the coupling parameter too high or too low, you, get, you don't get good results. You have to kind of get right in the middle. If the coupling factor is, is not strong enough, very few of the oscillators lock or lock very poorly. If it's too large, 
that all the oscillators will lock uh, for a given degree of, uh, for a given um, frequency spread. Uh, similarly, with damping, if you cure the circuit is too high, then uh, nothing co or couples very well, or it takes a very long time to, count, to uh, couple, and if it's too low, then everything couples, or couples, and it doesn't give you the differentiation you need. So the bottom line is there's a sweet spot in this matrix. If you, if you look for, for a given frequency spread, uh, if you look at the, the variation parameters of eta, uh, eta n versus frequency spread, you see that, um, that there's one optimum where the value of the product between the, it's the, it's the dissipation coupling product has to be approximately equal to 2w to get optimal, optimal coupling. And that's, uh, that's again, engineering trade-offs that when you start trying to implement these in practice, you have to take care to set your coupling parameters, coupling coefficients right, consistent with the Q to be able to resolve, uh, do the filtering that you need to do. So that brings me to the conclusions. And what I ho hope, hope I've left you with is uh, the idea that convolutional filtering is a dominant operation in many vision processing uh, and pattern matching applications. And that we can do those convolutional integrals with uh, oscillator arrays. Uh, there are some tricks to the trade. Uh, we have to get, choose the parameters of the, uh, of the oscillator arrays correctly if we want to get good results. And then uh, the factors of 20 or so are, seem to be optimum. I have not gone into the power required for doing that. That's an open issue. Uh, the, the hope is we'll be able to provide uh, Dan with the seven orders of magnitude he's looking for. Uh, but the, uh, the, uh, and we're in the process of uh, understanding what all the requirements are, power requirements of the supporting circuitry to uh, uh, the memory operations, the, the D to A, A to D uh, conversions and all that. And uh, uh, stay tuned and we'll be able to tell you uh, more about that. So any questions? So the Gabor filtering and the convolution seemed pretty core to what you were doing. Um, if in a more kind of neural um, algorithm where you have a lot of different filters and are not a set of canonical filters, how well is this going to scale? It's, it's the same process. Gabor, or you can, if you're doing facial identification, you know, you, you, there's various ways of characterizing a human face. Uh, and you, you, you can do, we've done that to where we've uh, used eigenfaces, if you will, and, and, and then see how well it matches. But it's the same operation. If you have a filter, uh, a pattern that you're trying to match, it, it does exactly what a dot product will do, uh, only it, it does it with analog devices in this uh, in this manner, it, let, it lets the physics do the computing is the, is the mantra that we like to, to say. And hopefully with less energy. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's the hope here. It's being done with less accuracy. Clearly, these are probably three to four bit uh, accuracy. Uh, but that's really all you need for most matching operations. And it's being done quickly. It's being done in unit time rather than uh, just the time it takes to load the information and, and synchronize the oscillators. So, but yeah, the, the question is, when you do the da other data handling that you need to do, what, what are you going to wind up with in the way of energy savings? So that's, that's the question.